How is everybody? Good, good. Yes. Welcome to the Gender Road Christian Church. So today we celebrate God's creation, God's creation of the earth, which includes us. And so you will notice that we have the themes of the earth, the waters, and we also have some bags of potting soil, ways to get nice and dirty today, because we're going to plant some seeds. Because as you know, we've been talking about uh, our study and stewardship, which are the seeds of new life. We also have up in front baskets of animals. So we're going to need help today. There's going to be two things that you will be participating in. One is coming forward in a little bit to grab some seeds. And we have on each table uh, four different seeds. And you can either take a, a cup of dirt that's already there, or you're going to scoop the dirt into your cup, and you're going to plant the seed, and then you can put that around wherever you would like on the chancel area. And then we're also going to need your help in placing some of these other animals to help fill up God's creation. So you should have received, when you came in with your bulletin, your uh, second sheet of the seeds, our study in stewardship. Hang on, kids, don't leave yet, don't leave yet, don't leave, don't leave. Because we put this up here so that you could get your hands dirty. So um, we want you guys to come on forward. You can come up here and get in the first row. That way you can be first to plant. So our seeds, our study and stewardship. And so again, when we look at how seeds, the word seeds have been used in the Bible, the word seed is used 79, or 73 times in 79 different sections. And in the Old Testament, last week we covered in the book of Genesis how seed, I'll explain what you guys are to do in just a second. Yeah, so hang on just one moment, although my guess is you can probably figure out what to do. All right, so let's listen here. Seeds, we see the seeds is used in the, in the Old Testament. In Genesis, we talked about how all seeds were given to us by God. So now let's look. Um, at the sheet in front of you, we also have some of the scriptures, I think, up on the overhead. And so we see where the word seeds are, are used further on in the Old Testament. And so in Leviticus 27, all ties from the land, whether the, um, the seed from the ground or the fruit from the tree, are the Lord's. They are holy to the Lord. And so we understand this biblically, that God asks us to give back, to be able to use in ministry, to be able to use in our love towards others, a tenth of what God has given to us. That means 90% of everything we have, we can use for what we deem to, to we need, but God asks 10%. Give that back, and I can do more with that than you can imagine. Ecclesiastes 11.6, In the morning sow your seed, and at the evening do not let your hands be idle. For you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Now, Ecclesiastes is a very interesting book to read, but again, here what they're saying is in the morning you sow, but don't let your hands be idle. In other words, don't sit there and be bored, put into use, be doing something because you don't know what's going to happen. My mom used to always say, don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today because you never know what's going to happen. Isaiah 30, he will give, great, he will give rain for the seed with which you sow the ground, the grain, the produce of the ground, which will be rich and plenteous. So God provides for these seeds that we put in the ground, because we know seeds need what to grow? Water, exactly. And that's what the rain does. It comes down. Which leads us into Isaiah 55. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. And so we know that the rain comes down and waters. And so we see here that the seed is mentioned in the Old Testament, and it has references to um, where sometimes in other scriptures, which I've not provided for you, um, where we see that things, when people fall out of the will of God, then the seeds don't prosper, they don't grow, that they plant in the ground. Seeds are also used to signify the very beginning of things, to signify God's goodness and the completeness of what God provides to us. Also, we talked about the consequences of disobedience. The seed is also used in the Old Testament as referencing a, a new way, a new start, or even a people. Um, uses a metaphor as the seed that they were planted and people went into a new land. So that's some of the ways in which seed is used. 
And so we're going to today, everyone is going to be invited to come forward, and our youth are going to start us off. And so we have a bunch of cups, and you're going to scoop your cup into the bag of potting soil. And then we have different seeds up here, and you can use whatever seed you want, and then you're going to stick that seed down into the dirt. Then we want you to go ahead and place that seed somewhere, anywhere up on the chancel, and we're going to see what grows from that, okay? And then we also need some help. You see kids behind you, we've got the baskets with animals. If you want to take a few of those animals and place them here and there, that would be good. The last thing that we're going to ask you to do, if you would like, do you remember these cards that we completed? Back in Advent, the first Sunday in Advent, hope, all right? So we have all these. And if you would like, you can take this card and put it in the net over here. Again, these seeds that we planted, it might be interesting to go ahead and read that and see if a hope has come true. We've all written on these cards. And so again, we're offering these back to the Lord. Sound good? So if you would like, my friends, come forward, grab a seed, let this be a time where you are realizing the implanted word, the seed that God is putting in your soul, for God, Jesus Christ, has the power to save. Yes? You can place them anywhere up here, and then we're going to put, take one of these cards, and you can place them in the net. There's a sample done for you over there. And go ahead, and you can take a look at what's been written on these cards. I have a critter up here that appeared. Let's pray together a prayer of illumination. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. <clears throat> so it was recently we were at the ballpark and we had our dog Carly with us. Some of you know Carly, she's very friendly easygoing dog, and so a mother walked up with her three-year-old and said, can we pet your dog? And we said, sure, go ahead. And so uh, I turned away and let Tracy deal with that, and, and they were done petting the dog. And so the mother told the little three-year-old boy, okay, say thank you. No. No, you need to say thank you. They let you pet the dog. No. And then is what happens, what young three-year-olds do, that crying, meltdown, you know, all that stuff. And I look back, like, yeah, I've been there. I know that. I just stepped away a little more. And <clears throat> so eventually the mother had the child sit down right there, and the child wanted to go play. I'm not really, really quite sure what happened all after that, but it just got me thinking, we spend so much time trying to teach and rear and train and help our young ones with good manners. And then all of a sudden, we stop doing that. I mean, we always kind of try. My mother, uh, until the day she passed, was always trying to correct me and train me and <laughs> say things. And she would always say, I'm your mother. I just have to say this. OK. And so I made me start thinking in this passage today out of 1 John is sort of the Holy Spirit comes in almost in this motherly role. And what the, the author of 1 John is helping us try to understand is that there is this conviction that happens. That when we are not acting and doing and loving as the church is called to do, our heart should let us know. Our heart should let us know. And that even if our heart would fail to let us know, God will let us know. But thankfully, God, who is far greater than any of us, was able to deal with us in mercy and in love. And so we look at 1 John today, and we don't preach much from 1 John, though it's a very rich um, uh, epistle. So there's 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. We find them in the New Testament. Okay? And so uh, these are short letters. Exactly when they were written, we don't know. It could have been written right around um, before the turn of the first century, but they're definitely referenced in 130 A.D. and 180 A.D. in the, in, in the church fathers that 
um, were helping the church get going in those first early couple hundred years. The author of 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John is believed to be the same as the author of as the Gospel of John. And so there's a lot of similarities in there. And so we go with that. And so in 1 John 3.16, verses 16 through 24. Now you may sound familiar, right? John 3.16, but it's not John 3.16. This is 1 John 3.16 through 24. So there's a big difference. But you'll hear some themes which will, should sound familiar to you. So it reads this. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. Any guesses who that is? Jesus, yes. And we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this, we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God. And we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandments that we should believe in the name of a son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit that he has given us. So this is pretty straightforward, but yet it can be a little confusing. So let's go through it again real quick. So we know love by this, that Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. So in this letter, this community which received the letter was feeling a little bit persecuted, um, and there's actually references to Cain and Abel. Um, remember Cain murdered his brother Abel. And so they are trying to resist the Cains of the world that are um, impacting their church. So they're, they're, they're feeling there's consequences from carrying your cross. This is what Jesus tried to get his disciples to understand. There's, and when we carry our cross, when we live into the gospel, you are going to be unpopular with some people. It will change. So um, he says, you know, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Yet many of us will never have the opportunity, nor will freely choose to lay down our life for another. And so he goes on with something a little more perhaps realistic or practical. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? How do, how do we be the church? How do you live your life when you see that there's another in need and yet you do not help? And so right away, there's this conviction in us. Our hearts should be thinking, yes, how do I help out another? How am I able to take some of what has been given to me and share that then with another? Little children, a common term that was, you will find in the Gospel of John. Little children, us, let us love, not just in word or speech, but in truth and action. Being in the word, understanding the word, understanding the scripture, the truth. The truth, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit who comes in truth, uh, we refer to it as the paraclete. You know, J Jesus in the Gospel of John said, when I leave, I will give you another, a comforter. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. And so we start to read this, that we know we are from the truth, we know we're acting in the will of God. When our hearts sort of resonate, they let us know that this is the right thing in which you are to be doing. And this, this, resonate, this, this resonating will come from the leading, the abiding um, Holy Spirit that is within you will help you know that yes, this is good, or no. There's this conviction that you know you're out of line, you know you're not doing what you need to do. But God is greater than our hearts, because we as our human hearts, that may fail us. Because again, hearts biblically was supposed to be the center of our moral actions and thoughts. And so you know, scripturally, when you talk about the heart, that heart should be leading you to do the right thing. 
but we fail if we rely only on our physical and um, our worldly understanding. We have to have the full love of Jesus Christ in us in order to love others properly. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God. And so then again, if we are in, um, in the will, doing what's being guided to us by the Holy Spirit, then we can have this assurance, this boldness before God, because we are asked to believe in His Son, Jesus Christ. We know we are saved. You receive this eternal life. That does give you boldness. Now, eternal life, again, is not just this future survival after we pass away. Eternal life, as John talks about, is, is this accomplished reality. It's this thing that begins now. This love that is lived out in community with each other and with those whom you do not know. This is what life is. This eternal life in John 10, 10, I come so that you may have life and you may have it abundantly. That doesn't mean that you might have 20 cars or 10 houses. It means that you might have this life, this love, this understanding, this freedom, this receiving of mercy and grace that you then live out in the fruits of your spiritual maturity which start to shine, which start to grow, which come forth as you are in mission, as you are in being the church, as you are in helping another, as you are serving. Verse 22, And we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And so, therefore, in all of this, as you are trying to serve and love and be in community, the author here is saying, don't forget to pray. You are to pray. And we can receive whatever we ask when we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, again, this is not, well, hey, I'd really like the million dollars right now. That's what I'm praying for, right? Or, you know, I'd really like to see this person punished over there. No, this is prayer that comes in because as you are in love, as Jesus is abiding in you and you're abiding in Jesus, as you are doing, you pray those things, um, there's alignment, your priorities have shifted, you've transformed, you've changed, and so those things that you thought you were going to pray for, you realize, I don't, I don't need all that. That's not what I need to pray for. I pray for God's will to be done, and Jesus set that norm for us. Jesus taught us how to pray, not my will, but your will be done. And this is the commandment that we should believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Remember, I swear he had all these commandments, but it all boils down into that you love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind, that you love your neighbor as yourself. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. So there's this abiding, there's indwelling, there's, you know, it gets even translated as tenting, you know, tent, living, intermingling. And by this we know that he abides in us, that we believe in Jesus Christ, that's who we've professed in. So we know that Jesus abides in us because we will have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that is in us, this Holy Spirit then that will help convict us, lead us in the way. It's whom we pray to, it's who we trust to guide us, it's who we listen for. It's all part of this trinity, which no one has the true right answer on how it all works together. But we have God, the Jesus who's walked God in the flesh with us. God is part of the Holy Spirit, which then um, speaks to us and leads us and makes things happen. Makes things happen because we are still on the fourth Sunday of Easter, and with resurrection, that was possible because of God raising Jesus Christ from the dead, because Christ is risen. That means there are new possibilities in our life. These seeds that we plant bring new life. It is a new start. The resurrection power of Jesus allows us to see more possibilities in the people and situations around us than we otherwise might see. These seeds are planted, seeds that grow into expectations. So the church manifests itself in love and word and deed and action, speech and truth. That we love one another. So we're not to be stifled by bitterness, by self-interest, by jealousy, by vengeance, 
getting even, right? I mean, have anybody else ever thought that way? You know, I had somebody cut me off driving yesterday. It was actually very dangerous. I was getting over to the right. I was actually not doing anything wrong for once. And um, the person cut way too early up behind me. And had I not just glanced, I would have went right over and we'd have gotten in a wreck. So obviously stuff rose up within me, right? Am I the only one that happens? <laughs> Jacob was with me. I can't remember what I said. <laughs> Pooch is probably good at this point. But those things are happening, right? And so we have that, that's, that's, we want these things to happen, but it's then what do we do? How do you then pray in Jesus' name? You see, we're, this whole thing is about us learning to live and grow in spiritual maturity. It's about having this voice, something that we recognize that is leading us in life so that when we pet the nice dog, we say thank you. When we do things, we know that it's the right thing to do. We realize that there's, there's, there's down the stream impacts of being good to another person without expecting anything in return. Because it's all about us being, becoming spiritually mature as we live into the mission of which God has called us to be, the mission of your life, the, where God has called you and what you, what you need to do in your life, the mission of this church. Now, I read this quote last week, but it's so good and powerful that we have to read it again. Because again, as we show maturity, it's not just behavior modification. I'm not just talking about behaving and doing the right thing because you, without having internal transformation. See what I mean? Anybody can behave right one or two times, but when does it become a habit? When does it become the essence of who you are? You know, you say you want to be a Christian, so are you doing those things and behaving in a way that starts to consistently show you are a Christian. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be right. You are going to sin. You are going to mess up. That's why we have forgiveness. But what is this internal transformation that is happening that flows out of a right heart, a righteous heart, a good heart for the right motivation? So Charles Spurgeon, again, says this in the middle of the 1800s. And he talks to us specifically saying, you're either a missionary or an imposter. You're either a believer of Jesus Christ, and it's who you love and what you do and it's who you talk about and share with others, or you're an imposter. He says this, if Jesus is precious to you, you will not be able to keep your good news to yourself. You will be whispering it into your child's ear. You will be telling it to your husband. You will be earnestly imparting it to your friend. Without the charms of eloquence, you will be more than eloquent. Your heart will speak. Your eyes will flash as you talk of his sweet love. Every Christian here is either a missionary or an imposter. Recollect that. You either try to spread abroad the kingdom of Christ, or else you do not love him at all. It cannot be that there is a high appreciation of Jesus and a totally silent tongue about him. But the man who says, I believe in Jesus, but does not think enough of Jesus to ever tell another about him by mouth or pen or tract is an imposter. You are either doing good or you are not good yourself. If thou knowest Christ, thou art as one that has found honey, thou wilt call others to taste it. Be wise in your generation, speak of him in fitting ways and at fitting times, and so in every place proclaim the fact that Jesus is most precious to your soul. Pretty direct words that speak to the essence of who are we trying to be as Christians? I mean, it's sort of what Chris was talking about today in his testimony. Well, you know, I'm willing to do this, but not this. But then when you realize that you encounter this Jesus Christ, it's transforming. And you realize, I want to do this. I want to tell others. I want to show acts of love by helping, by doing, by giving, by being there.
most of the time when you are reflecting Christ, when you know Christ and you love Christ and able to imitate Christ because you've watched Christ, you've read about Christ, you've prayed with Christ, you've talked, you've confessed, you've cried, you've gotten angry, you've shared, you've felt the forgiveness, you've felt the relief of the guilt and the burdens. You're loving. You're imitating, you're being with another. And most of the time, those are moments that we can't post on Instagram or on even Facebook. Because it's really not very exciting to see. Um, Rob Bell and I were having a conversation. Actually, he was doing most of the talking, I was listening, but responding in my mind. But he was talking about this that, you know. When you're on social media so much, you see all this glamorous stuff that happens and exciting things, but the reality of life is how many of you to this past week sat with somebody and listened to them as their heart was breaking? Or you shared food with somebody? Or you helped somebody out or you gave them a phone call? That doesn't make the papers. That doesn't make a Facebook post. You're not going to get 100 likes on Instagram I mean, how many of you worked hard just to be able to pay the rent, buy the groceries, raise the kids? That doesn't get a, a lot of, you know, shout outs on social media. But that's the daily discipline of living a life in Christ where most of society is not willing to take the time and investment in following that path of spiritual maturity in the discipline of being a Christian. This whole year, we're focusing on what is your next step? What is your next step? You see, the whole concept of planting seeds is to help us as Christians, as the people in this community, is what this congregation is focusing on right now, is to realize that there is a better plan out there than what the world says. Because the world wants everything to be instant, instantaneous, right away, flip the switch, make it happen. I don't even have to wait now for my coffee to brew because my Keurig does it in, what, 30 seconds. Instant. When I was buying the seeds, Dave, who's the owner over there at Failers in Lithopolis, and he's a member of David Lutheran Church, he uh, was talking, he's like, oh, well, you don't want to get this seed here because that's going to take like three or four weeks to grow. These others will be sprouting in like two weeks. And I'm like, oh my goodness, i got to wait two weeks? <laughs> right? We want it now. The consumers in us want to come and say, you know, transform my life right now. Well, i got news for you. The green beans we planted, you're not going to be picking beans tomorrow. Right? This Jesus that you follow loves you now, loves you instantly now. But this desire to know Jesus and imitate Jesus takes a lifetime. But it's a joyous journey. There is no other way. You're compelled to follow, to love, and to serve. And so these seeds help us understand that God has a better plan. So quit beating yourself up. Know that it's a journey and that we're all in this together in the messiness of life. Because this dirt's messy. I didn't even think to put napkins out there. And Gene, our janitor, when he saw all this, I said, yeah, sorry, we're probably going to make a mess today. And he's like, that's all right. I got a sweeper. That's love. That's all right. I got a sweeper. Let's be the church. Amen.